which is to look at the individual painters, to try and think about the painters' lives. When people uh, look at a Caravaggio, they don't say this is School of Rome, they say this is Caravaggio. We know about the knife fights he had, we know about the mistresses he slept with, uh, uh, the prostitutes he uh, brought from the brothels to paint as the Virgin Mary, the scandal this caused in the Vatican, and so on. We have these uh, uh, lives of Western artists um, in the Renaissance through Vasari, uh, subsequently, you know, everyone is brought up knowing sto stories of Van Gogh, uh, the different painters, uh, the way Picasso slept around. We have all this stuff. We have a whole body of biography uh, and lives to attach to the paintings that we look at. Uh, when Professor Goswami was beginning off, uh, there were virtually no um, na individual names used in the study of Indian painting. People talked about Mughal painting, Rajput painting, uh, the painting of Bundi or the paint Pahari painting. And the reason for this is that in many cases, the artists themselves have come, have come from relatively modest backgrounds. Uh, they considered themselves often craftsmen. Sometimes they uh, were from the carpenter's craft and doubled up as carpenters. Uh, they did not, in most cases, uh, although with many notable exceptions, particularly during the Mughal period, when there were great celebrity artists that could travel from court to court. But in most cases, they did not think of themselves uh, as, uh, as great uh, artistic stars. Uh, they, they were craftsmen working for a patron, and they were often um, struggling to make a living. Uh, and, and if they moved from patron to patron, it was as much often in the search for their daily bread and support for their families as anything else. But uh, Bridge Goswami did not take this silence sitting down, so to speak, and went out uh, to find ways to reconstruct the lives, searching in the corners of paintings, under the, uh, the hooves of horses, uh, a, a signature uh, for what, which Mughal artist on the, on the uh, to show his humility before his Mughal patron, one artist uh, drew his, uh, his signature on the shovel picking up the dung of an elephant. Uh, who was this? This was, uh, which artist? Abul Hassan? Abul Hassan. Um, uh, and uh, most famously, his great coup was uh, in 1968, uh, attempting to give uh, a, a, a biography to the greatest of all Pahari painters, Nine Suit. Uh, he, had the, he saw a painting uh, of uh, his patron, uh, of, of what seemed to be um, Nine Suit taking the ashes of his patron, Balwant Singh, uh, to be cremated at Hardwa. And he had the idea of going to Hardwa and looking up the pundas who keep the records of the pilgrims and see if there was uh, a record for the 1790s. Um, and in due course, the, 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 the volume had disappeared. Uh, 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 Dr. Goswami's charm is such that the following day, the pundar appeared at his hotel room bearing the relevant volume and he flicked through a few pages. Suddenly there was the entry for Nine Sook, giving his entire genealogy, the name of his parents, grandparents, brother, uh, and even a little picture of uh, the Ganga coming out of Lord Shiva's head in, in the invisible in style of Nine Sook. Uh, and that has been the beginning of a career uh, whereby uh, having first, in a sense, established the, uh, the family of Nine Sook and written this wonderful article pointing out that in fact, families had style and that the families went from one court to another, they would usually take that style with them. So to say that something is Goulet style uh, or Jasrota has less meaning than to say it is by Nine Sook and his brother Manoku. Uh, and it's something we would assume automatically with a Western artist, but for various reasons has not, that dignity has not been given to the painters uh, uh, of Indian miniatures or Indian painters in general. Uh, since then, he had a, a great exhibition on Pahari painting, uh, whereby it was organized by the names of the artists of different families. And then as a kind of climax of, of his life's work in the last uh, three years has produced two remarkable books. The first was a two volume book called Masters of Indian Painting when he applied the same methodology to the whole of Indian painting and with a great raft of 35 of the leading scholars of Indian painting through what is for me certainly the greatest exhibition of Indian painting ever thrown. It was, it was an incredible gathering of masterpieces uh, in the Rietberg in Zurich. Paintings that had never been brought outside the country were brought particularly from Iran and Russia. Um, uh, in a sense, the paintings from the great Western collections have become better known. Many of them are online now, but uh, uh, often very obscure paintings from uh, these wonderful collections in, 
Russia and Iran, many of which came from the looting of the Mughal court by Nadir Shah in 1739 and then were handed on by Nadir Shah to the Russians uh, and to the Ottoman Sultan. And then this year, um, in a book which very beautifully complements that book, uh, a book called The Spirit of Indian Painting, which is the story of a hundred of your favorite paintings, um, but with a beautiful short 35-page introduction, which I would strongly recommend every single person in this audience or anyone with the slightest interest in Indian painting to read, because it's a, it's a beautiful concentration of a lifetime's writing and learning in just 30 pages. What is the essence of Indian painting? What is it that makes Indian painting what it is? Uh, anyway, we'll, I've seen the lecture we're about to hear uh, twice before, and, and as I say, you will, I'm sure, agree with me that it's, uh, it's going to be a terrific treat. Please welcome Dr. Bridge Goswami. May I say how overwhelmed I feel and honored I am at being here this afternoon. The most generous words of William Dalrymple, uh, which I'll try and live up to in a very small measure. Before we get on to the main subject, may I issue you to you or recommend to you the fact that I am starting with three reservations or cautions, if you like. I have shown these pictures, many of them, to different audiences. And there may be many people here who are seeing these paintings for the first time, second time, third time, I do not know. But fortunately, nobody has ever died of looking at the same pictures twice. <laughs> <coughs> so I have survived. Um, so, if you are tired of looking at the same paintings, you might like to sit close to the exit. <laughs> the other fact that I would like to bring you to your attention is this. That we're going to enter a very, very subtle world. Let's be aware of that. You know, the great Urdu poet, Mir Taqi Mir, said at one point of time, Le Saans Vi Ahista ke nazuk hai bahut kaam, aafaak ki iskar gahe shisha gari ka. Breathe gently here and soft, for the world that we are going to enter is brittle, fragile. This world that has been put together by the powers on high is of such a nature that we have to step into it gently and soft. The third thing, in a slightly perverse way that is peculiar to me, I will enter this particular field laterally. I will not immediately go on to the paintings that I have published in this particular book. But I'll take you slowly, or take myself slowly through this particular world. I'm puzzled by a number of Indian paintings. I do not understand them at all, many of them. But I keep at it, and I like you to keep at it. Take, for instance, this particular painting, which is not in the book, but which I'm very fond of. What is it that you and I are looking at? Some chamber of a royal palace? The architect suggests that. There are three lamps with three wicks in them. And nothing else. What could it be? Is there a higher meaning to it? I don't know. I really do not know. But I get some help, a little help, from what is inscribed on the top border in a script that I can read and most of you may not be able to. And that says, Deep 37. Deep Lamp 37 suggests to me that it is from a series? Is it a dream picture? Somebody has had a dream, the patron of the painter, 
and then the painter wants to present it to the Maharaja or whoever it is and the dream is, dream is to be interpreted. Is it auspicious? Is it not auspicious? We don't know. I'm just left at that. I'd have no other piece of evidence as to what it contains. This is an exquisite piece of calligraphy by a contemporary Syrian artist. This is the way in which I approach Indian painting, or we have to, because this is all belong, all of this belongs to a very distant past, and we have to make an effort to enter this particular world. I know that there are some letters of the Arabic alphabet here. But the moment I recognize a dal or a jim, it disappears. Yeah, you are completely lost as to what he intended to say. So it's a jumble, so to speak. It is a thing that you think has come within your grasp for a moment, and then it slips out. This painting, one of the great painters of the hills, a painter called Manaku, now, it's representative of what I am in the cloud of unknowing, right? We do not know what it all is about. So the inadequacy of the likes of me who are art historians is apparent. Incidentally, I mean, as a, on a light note, I might mention that my great friend, Karl Khandalawala, art historian, and I used to sit down with this painting and try to identify art historians uh, in this particular painting. We would disagree from time to time. That is so-and-so. No, no, that is so-and-so. Whatever. We are a peaceable community, but we have our prejudices. Mm. <coughs> but look at this painting. <coughs> Sheikh Saadi is seated. The great poet of Iran. There is a majlis. Some people are singing. And one man, an old man with a snowy white beard, throwing up his hands in the air. Is it is ecstasy of some kind, vajd, so to speak. I do not know what is it that, I did not know what is it that is moving this man who is raising his hands up in the air like this till I turned the painting on its back. And I saw a qata, the very one which Sheikh Saadi, for instance, has written. Is in Persian. I know all of you know Persian, but I, all the time I'll try and translate it. <coughs> what does it say? Gili khushbu e dar hamam ruzi, rasid az daste mahbubi vadastam, badu gufta ke mushki ya abiri ke man az bu e dilavi is mastam, ba gufta man gili na chiz budam, valekin mudate bagul nishastam. Kamale ham nashin bar man asar kard bagarna man hamo khakam ke hastam. Meaning what? One day, Saadi says, <coughs> I entered the public bath. This is a century in which we are, did not have baths at home. And as I entered, my beloved handed me a piece of clay, like a cake of clay. There were no soaps at that time. You cleanse yourself with those fine clay pieces. And I put it to my nose and I spoke to it. And what are you, I said, that you are so fragrant that I am completely besotted by your fragrance. Am, are you amber? Are you musk? And out of the kindness of his heart, the piece of clay spoke back to me and said, I am just a humble piece of clay. But I do remember that I come from the same soil in which some roses used to grow. Mm. And it is the company that I kept which has made me what I am. What mm. else am I? A fistful of dust? <laughs> extraordinary, extraordinary utterance. On the one hand, great company is something to be celebrated. But the subtlety, the extraordinary layering of it and so on, and the rhythms of the speech and so on, 
so extraordinary that you and I can equally get besotted, not only by the verse, but by a painting such as this. So what are we talking about? We're talking about various helps that we can take from things, inscriptions, texts, information, stories. Look at this painting, for instance. From the Satasaya of Bihari, it's not in the book, so don't be worried about it. Uh, but I just, as I said, I'm leading yourselves, you and myself, into it rather gently. The text at the top says, Adhar Adharata Harike Parata Oat, Deet, Patajot Par Harika Baski Basuri Indra Dhanush Siddhanta The moment he puts Krishna, flute to his lips, then other colors start pouring in, the black of his eyes, the ruby red of his lips, the yellow of his garment, and suddenly that little piece of green bamboo turns into a rainbow as it were. But let's look at it from a little closer. This is of course Krishna. And as we look at it, we start taking in or internalizing the various colors, whether it is the colors of the leaves of the tree or of the clouds in the sky and so on. And two sakis, two companions, admirers, beloveds of Krishna, stand at one side, looking at him and all this with eyes of wonder. The other part of the painting, there are five of them. And one of them is pointing in that direction, hand raised in there. See there, and there it is, that rainbow. But a rainbow descended to the ground, surely the painter knows. Everyone has seen the rainbow in the sky. Why on the ground? And the shape of the rainbow has been changed. It's become a kind of a, like an entrance is the mouth of a cave, the cave of experience that you and I are invited to enter. In the Nathadwara tradition, in Udaipur, uh, close to Udaipur, at Nathadwara, they speak of something called a Giri Kandara. Giri is mountain, Kandara is a cave. So it is a cave of experience that you and I are being, in a certain sense, invited what you will find inside that cave, we don't know. The mystery of it all, the sense of anticipation of it all, the spirit of adventure of it all is what it is about. Experience is what the painter is talking about. <coughs> Sometimes we run into things which we didn't expect were there. In the Nathadwara tradition, the textiles, which we call pitchwise, great big hangings um, at that particular temple and in the homes of devotees, there are these enormous hangings, the size of these screens, for instance, or even larger than them. And they, it's an exquisite work. And in them, if you notice, there are, Krishna is always the hero, but in this series of hangings, which belong to the Varsha Ritu, season of rains, Krishna does not appear. The Sakhis are there, the Gopis are there, they're bringing gifts to Krishna, celebrating. Now one of the things you might, might notice is, and I'm going to show four or five paintings from the same series. Painted at different times, there are three Sakhis to the right, three to the left, in the center there is a tree, maybe symbolizing the presence of Krishna. But the background is completely filled with tiny little flowers that keep falling from the trees. Varsharitu. In another painting, similar things happen. That background is completely filled, as you notice, with tiny little jasmine-like flowers. And this is a usual thing. They're superbly painted things, but these little star-like flowers fill the entire background. One, two, three, 
we see painting after painting of the same scene. But look at this painting of Shota Varshari. The flowers have disappeared from the background completely, except that they are all around the one tree in the middle. Why? You can lose yourself in this beauty of this particular tree or the peacock. You can concentrate upon the cows who are waiting for Krishna. But when you look at that particular tree and the flowers around it, if you join the ends of these flowers, the dots, you'll see the figure of Krishna standing. <laughs> I had seen this particular painting, this pitch white, again and again. And only one day, when I took uh, some friends of mine to look at those pitch wise in the textile museum at, uh, at Ahmedabad, there's some enthusiast for Krishna outside, I don't know, mm -hmm. but whatever. So one day when I was standing in front of, sitting in front of that particular pitch wise, it struck me, that is what it is all about. One foot raised, if you notice at the bottom, one elbow sort of at an angle holding the fruit. And I can't describe to you the moment I thought I recognized something here. So it is this which makes these things come alive. You and I have to concentrate upon these particular words to take from them. Kumara Swami said that. He said, you Take from a work of art what you bring to it. The utsa, the energy that you have to use to enter a work of art and see it in its own terms. Did the painter of this Pichwai 200 years ago or 175 years ago, did he know that someday in the city of Jaipur, in the Digi Palace, this painting will be shown and then people will discover he did it for himself or as a challenge to his own con uh, contemporaries, his own peers, we don't know. But it is the sense of discovery, it is that thing which fills you with this sense of elation. You know, we very often use the word goosebumps, right, like this and so on, but that sounds like a disease. I mean, um, uh, <laughs> <coughs> we, I mean we call it in Sanskrit, Roma Harsha, the hair on my body is happy. Right, the fine hair in my body becomes happy. Look at my face. Painters challenge themselves or others. The painting by the great Nain Suk, about whom um, William spoke with such passion and enthusiasm, like me. Painting, which is in the Boston Museum now, of elephants, wild elephants being captured by tamed elephants. Tremendous skirl and blare and noise you can see in the lower part of the painting. This is what it is. Superbly drawn. You can see the tiny figures of the Mahavas on the back of these people rushing around, tying ropes to the legs of the must elephants and so on, wild elephants. And you can get completely lost in this because that's how the human eye travels. It concentrates upon action or what the center of the painting contains. But if you draw yourself back a little and see this extraordinary vista, which is stretches in the background, this lake filled with elephants bathing and so on, but notice one little detail. If you concentrate upon the right side of the painting, in the middle of that, under a tree, you see a monkey seat. The naked eye cannot see it. The monkey has a red face, only because I'm blowing it up, and a very interesting tail. And then when you start looking for this, more and more, you see there's a monkey towards the right, and then if you tr allow the eye to travel left, there's an island in the lake where two deer are seated facing why did he paint that? Why did Nancy go to this effort? If your eye can, no. my cannot, mine in any case is not too good. I mean, if your eyes cannot 
discern these with the naked eye, you can't see this. So why was he doing this? He's challenging himself, perhaps. Maybe winning a bet against another painter, who knows? This is the way things go. So the more you look, the more you discover, and the greater the joy of discovery. That is a spirit with which Indian painters very often worked. This extraordinary drawing I discovered in the family, in a family of traditional painters. Strange phenomenon, strange appearance, a goddess with standing on one leg, uneven number of arms, nine on the one side, six on the other. But if you concentrate upon it, Uh, you discover around that there are little circles in which names of states are written. You can't read them, but Kila Kangra, Guler, Jaswan, Tatarpur, and so on, Jasarota, Basoli. So I, I, interp I have, I'm left to my own devices to interpret this particular work. What is it that the painter was doing? I have chanced my arm by suggestion that these are names of states or areas where the members of this particular family of painters worked. So the spread of the style of this family that is, in a certain sense, documented graphically in this extraordinary drawing. Now what is this? It's a painting from Assam, not very early, but maybe late 18th, early 19th century. Believe it or not, this is the painter's view of what the original Meru mountain was like, the center of the universe, the cosmic mountain. But we have to trust him. This is extraordinary envisioning of the beginnings of it all. So in the center, there is this tiered kind of a thing, which is like cones, and towards the right and the left of it, there are other sort of a things moving in this direction or bending in that direction and so on. And there are four sacred trees which grow on those mountains, and those are represented here. But the painter says it is the Meru mountain. And if I were to ask him, how do you know? And he can turn around and ask me, how do you know that it is not the Meru mountain? It is an act of imagination of extraordinary, soaring imagination that you and I are looking at. So painting, painters move in strange ways. There are things which are unfathomable, incomprehensible, beyond your understanding and mine. As in the text, so in paintings. Look at this. The great Manuku again. What is he showing? What is he rendering here? The text says, the Bhagavad Purana says, in the beginning, because we are, the texts are seized of the issue of how it all began, you know, the creation. And the egg of Brahma descended into the waters. Hiranya Garbha. Hiranya, gold, Garbha, womb. So this egg of Brahma which descends on these waters. And these waters stretch from shore to endless shore to endless shore. Notice the fact, now this painting has to be, like all paintings in India, made on paper, had to be held in the hand, seen at this particular angle, at a distance of about 12 inches from the eyes, and you had to move the painting slightly. What has he done? How he does he enter water, the endless waters? Not as waves of anything or anything of the kind, but as little walls, so to speak, right? Almost as if a dendrologist would count the number of years that a tree has behind it and so on. So it, it is a timelessness of it all, which must have been in his mind. But wait, there is more to it. You photograph it from this angle, this is how it looks like the kind of a brownish thing, but you move it ever so slightly, and this is what it looks like. 
gleaming and shining gold, pure gold. So what is he doing? He's asking us to enter, to negotiate with the painting, hold it in his hand, your hand, and move it ever so slightly. How we can misread paintings is apparent from this particular work. It's a large painting from Patiala, Maharaja Narinder Singh, and a magnificent procession is on elephant back, the whole range of elephants on which he is seated, and the painting has been published or described as the procession of Maharaja Narinder Singh. There's a fair description. The Maharaja is seated on this golden hauda, in the golden hauda. His brother, the Kumar Saab, is by his side. I don't know whether somebody can help. I mean, I can't hear myself speak. I mean, anyway, but we have no control over this. So there are this, these elephants. And there's a cavalcade of people. Are the kind of, there are people, soldiers in uni European uniforms. There are riders on horseback. There are uh, Sipa walking by his side and so on. And we start believing that this is a procession of Maharaja Narendra Singh. But notice the fact that well ahead of the Maharaja, in the same painting, is this detail, where there are other elephants, and on the back of the elephant which is closest to us is the holy book of the Sikhs, the Guru Granth Sahib plays, and a man dutifully is waving a fly whisk over it out of reverence. So it is not the procession of Maharaja Narendra Singh. It is the procession of the holy book. And the Maharaja, as like a devotee, is following at a respectful distance far at the back. So we can misread it at the procession of Maharaja Narendra Singh, pomp and glory and circumstance and so on, but it is something entirely different. page from a sketchbook of an artist, all these crotheries, this mishmash, crossings, but there is a figure there towards the left. And that figure, the young boy dancing, who, who, who knows? Yes, could I um, interrupt at this point? Could one of the volunteers go to Wilson in the um, reception area of the hotel and tell him about this noise and see if he could do something about it or speak to Ram Pratab because it is disturbing the session. Uh, maybe one volunteer could go looking for Ram Pratab, Diggy, and the other person could go to Wilson. We need to have this stop. Now, there's a dancing figure of a young boy and we immediately, those of us who are used to looking at paintings with the Krishna theme dominating in them, we might imagine this is probably Krishna, then how is he Krishna? He, there is no iconographic detail, no more mukut, no yellow garment, no pitambar, no flute in his hand. But we withdraw a little, turn back, and then you find the same figure there. And on the same page, there are crisscross and hatchings and so on towards the left. The painter is, in a sense, is honing his brush and testing out the various pigments. So it is not meant for your eyes and mine, it's for his own eyes. But there's a group of women that he's introduced there, playing music, singing, or whatever. So who are they? I have no idea. Krishna dancing, and they are players, I mean, feminine groups, I mean, making music at the same time, holy, whatever it is. Sometimes help comes from poetry written at the back of or something which comes to your mind. Now, if you publish a painting like this and say a woman running indoors, you're not adding to anybody's information or perception of this. After it's all cl clearly a woman, and clearly she's not going out but running indoors. But the moment you relate it to the poetry of Bihari, Dhurvaho Hinali Uthe, Dhuma Dharani Chamukod, Jarat Avad Jagatko, Pavas Prathamukhaya. Meaning what? This is a Nayaka, a beloved, separated from her lover, and the season of longing clouds gathering in the sky, and she cannot bear the thought of looking at those clouds because they remind her of the lover. And she says to herself, that is not a cloud 
of monsoon in the sky. That is a cloud that of which, that is the fire of separation from which the smoke is rising and I cannot bear the sight of it. So she is there. Notice the way she's holding on to her dupatta, barely able to contain the wind that has got the fluttering of the dupatta or of your heart. She, Nayaka, superb painting from Bhumi, absolutely dazzling. Virahani again, separated from her lover. And everything reminds her of him in this season of longing. The text, not on this painting, but a very similar painting, reads, Yad aveda P.U.P. viraha uthe tanajad, ju chune ki kankari, Jab chirko tava. Whenever I think of the absent lover, agitated, it is as if my heart were a piece of limestone and a sprinkling of one dot, one, one drop of water, and it sizzles. Jo chune ki kankari, jab chirko tava. So we are looking at the things, we are looking at these paintings not in isolation, not as works of art painted by somebody 200 or 250 years ago and so on, but all kinds of thoughts crowd our minds, should crowd our minds, because they're a part of the tradition. If you are interested, you can count the number of beads, she's counting. If you're interested in hair, this is just model to follow, Whatever, but exquisitely done. When you look at a painting like this, it would seem to be completely confused to begin with, but it is Surdas, the blind poet of Mathura, whose composition the painter is rendering in visual terms. Surdas himself, if you notice at the painting, if you notice the painting at the bottom right, sitting there, playing upon his symbols. And it is the composition which the painter has taken. And it is that, what is the occasion? Radha says to Krishna, Kau Radha, Hausa. Let's exchange our roles. You become Radha and I become Shyam. And then the painter takes us through this. I'll take you through this slowly. Towards the bottom, uh, towards the top at the left, there is Krishna, it's Krishna, blue eye, blue complexion, and Radha, gold complexion, seated. Now standing next to him. Then suddenly it all changes. Krishna becomes Radha, and she becomes Krishna, and is combing his or her hair, whatever you could call it, right? And then you come to Manini Nayaka, to be cajoled and pleased, and she or he, whatever, sit at her feet. Slowly we, we go through the range of emotions. The exchange of roles has taken place. And again and again, we see them walking through the forest, bending, the lover bending over her, over the beloved in this fashion. And then at the very bottom, when we arrive slowly to that meander, she has now fully become Krishna, standing, towering over him. And he has become Radha and stands with folded hand up, appeasing her. And Surdas, the blind poet, goes on playing, not only then, not only in the 16th century, but keeps playing for it now, for you and for me. The magic of these paintings, the ability of the painter to make us enter a world which we did not suspect was there, is phenomenal. A painting which William very kindly discovered for us and published. It's a Sufi saint, Shah Sharf Buali Kalanda. 12th century, buried in Panipat, 
celebrated Darga. Many people visit it even now. This is the man. Sufi, Suf, woolen clothing. That's where the word comes from, most likely. In a certain sense, you know, disciplining your body. And he sits there like a holy man, like saintly man, under a tree. A tree and a, and a thinking man are associated in our tradition. And sits in a very plain sort of ground by the edge of a body of water. But he's sitting, those are no legs tucked under him. But his head is slightly turned towards the ground. What is he doing? Is this a part of namaz in which you turn your head left and right? I don't think so. My guess is that he is, there is a slight expression of wonderment on his face, a knitting of the eye, of the brow. I think he's trying to hear a sound which comes from nowhere, that anahar, anahar ki tari. If you think of that, if you pay the slightest attention to that, you see this painting completely transformed. And it will stay in your mind, I think, for a very long time. It's a simple painting, it is unknown. But there is this unstruck sound which great men, men of God, are able to hear or try and catch to hear. In the beginning of this essay that William very kindly referred to in some detail. I have cited a passage from a Kavya Artha and said, strange things happen to you when you encounter a work of art. Four stages, the unfolding of the heart, the heart is all wrapped up, so unfolding, is expansion, then is agitation, and finally, that is the ultimate vibration that spandan, that, that uh, sansanahat, that janjanahat and so on, so which you keep hearing long after you have left that world. This is what these paintings are capable of doing. In the Chaur Panchasaka series, the beloved whose moments are being, in a certain sense, recalled by the poet Billana, and he said, I now remember, I even today I remember that when she walked from the chamber to the cistern of, of water in which there were some lotuses growing, she puzzled the bumblebees whether they should head toward the lotuses or buzz around her lotus face. Paintings like this from the Rasamanjiri, late 17th century. The Nayaka and the lover, hero and heroine, have made love throughout the night, passionate love. The morning has dawned and the lover is unaware of it. But the Nayaka is clever. She's wearing, she was wearing, as ornaments in her ear, buds of lotuses. And the laws of nature, the morning dawns, and the bud starts opening. She doesn't want him to notice that. So quickly she covers her ears with her veil so that he remains unaware that the morning is there. You and I know that. Toward the right, the birds have come to that pool of water and you can almost hear them twittering. But she doesn't want him to know that. A Naika who sets out in the middle of the night to meet the lover, Abhisarika, one of the most favorite of all, all themes in Indian painting, in the, in the tradition of poetry. And she is moving out. And her Sakhi, her friend, says, I mean, the, the day has turned sour, the night has turned sour. Look at the cloud, look at the rain. And she haughtily turns back and says, I mean, the likes of me do not care for any of this, and we have to head. But the moment she steps, notice the rain falling like a string of pearls. The front foot, where she places it, the rain suddenly stops. And this painting, which has to be seen in the flesh to realize the magic of it all, 
the painter who used to use tiny little beetle wing cases because they glow and they used to put them in her jewelry and so on and so forth. He has cut them into tiny smithereens, scattered them all over the painting in the background. And if you hold the painting and you move it, you see countless fireflies in that moist light. We didn't just, we, I can't photograph it, but they are there, you trust my word for it. So what are we talking about? There are meanings to be read or to be imported into painting. There are constructions and reconstructions to be done. There is the dimension of imagination you and I have to bring into play. Jahangir looking at the portrait of his late father. A portrait within a portrait. Extraordinary painting of, of Jahangir's you know, magnificence of gold brocaded sort of dress, the, the pearls and the beads and the, and the rubies and emeralds and so on all shining. But what is he holding in his hand? Akbar, his father. Two painters worked on it, but what is the point of it? 1605, Jahangir became the emperor of India. His, he had, five years earlier, he rebelled against his father, set up independent court at Allahabad. And is this a moment of guilt? Is there some shadow of it somewhere in this? I don't know. Garchit, Paz Shah Surat Asad Mani Ulutfe Allah, Shah Nuruddin Jahangir, Ibn Akbar Paz Shah, Garchit, Dar Surat, Darand Dar Shahri Qayam, Leek Dar Mani Badar Vesha Punar Paz. The painter says, this man, Jahangir, Nuruddin, son of Akbar Padshah, is an emperor, is a king, both in appearance and inwardly, so to speak. Surat and Mani. Surat is externals, and Mani is the, what is inside of him. He says, even though the mightiest of the world stand in front of him, looking, asking for favors, or for the look of grace to fall upon them, it is on the darvesh, truly speaking, on the man who has nothing that his eye constantly falls. The book that he's handing over to that snow white bearded man is a sign of his favor. Where the Sultan of Turkey, King James I of England, stand at the foot of that extraordinary European influenced throne. What are we talking about? Essentially, that on these paintings, and a great many of them, um, I've, I've looked at a very large number of paintings, but this is what gives it the kind of spirit that I wish to draw your attention to. Jahangir had heard that there is a sannyasi by the name of Jadroop, and Jadroop was a man who lived near Ujjain, and he was in that environment, environment, and he said, I'll walk to the, because the sannyasi would not come anywhere. So he walks, he writes in his memoir, that I walked a number of miles to see that man who had no possession, who lived in, a, in an area which is kind of a, a rock, in the, which is a kind of a cave-like uh, entrance to it. That's where he lived. So look at the way the painter sets it up. The lower part of the painting, the retinue, is left behind. A screen of trees come in between. The space in the middle is there, and then Jahangir sits there talking to Jadru like this. The point is, in Persian we say, there is Shah, who is possession, who knows, has everything, and there's the Gada, who has nothing, the Fakir. But the painter is asking you and me the question, I think, tell, us, tell me, who is the Shah here, and who the Gada? Who is the king? The one, the one to whom the emperor has gone to seek enlightenment? Perhaps. This is the man, Jadru. A little loincloth wrapped around his 
skeleton life or the middle. It looks like I've taken the time. Yeah, no problem. Bunch of confused women, right? Doing all kinds of things. But if you relate it to the Bhagavad Purana, Krishna on the great night when the Rasa Leela was to take place, suddenly in order to break the pride, humble the pride of these women who think they have him under control, he disappears. And when he disappears, then there is consternation. And all of these women keep asking themselves, where is he gone? They ask the trees, they ask the animals in that particular space. And so on. And one of them has this bright idea. Why are we wasting our time? He'll come when he comes, right? Let's enact his deeds. So this is an enactment that you and I are seeing. I'll take you through this slowly. One Saki becomes Putana, the demoness, at whose breast, whose life he took away by sucking at her breast, was he recognized that this was a demoness. One Saki turns into that Ukhal, and one of them turns into his mother, Yashoda, with a chastising rod in her hands. One Saki plays upon the flute, he's becoming Krishna, and then others are being dragged away by jealous sisters-in-law and mothers-in-law and so on and so forth. One Saki throws up her dupatta in the air and becomes a Govardhan Dhari, the bearer of the great mountain. And one, this magical detail, throws her blue veil on the ground, it turns into the serpent Kaliya, and she stands on it and dances. You know, breathtaking in the vision that the painter must have had. Again, Krishna says to Uddhav, his friend, go back to Vrindavan, tell these friends of mine, I'm not going to come back. And Uddhav has a, a task cut out for him, telling the gopis, I'm not going to come back. And they say, what nonsense are you talking about? Uddhav says, no, 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 take your mind away from Krishna, meditate, do, do this. And they say, that, what philosophy, philosophy are you talking about? What madness? Uddhav, mana nahi das bees. We don't have 20 hearts, there's only one. And he took, us, took it away. Uddhav, koela pujat kanan, tum hamko upadesh karo ho, basam lagao hana. There is the, the, the coils are the, making the wonderful sounds in the garden, and you are telling us we should put basma on our, our forehead and turn into mendicants or, or recluses. But Uddhav, whom we see twice, this is Uddhav. His, the gopis are saying, come, we'll show you his footprint. He left them here with the promise of his return. Another one says, no, no, you can talk to us about your fine philosophy, Uddhav, but come, I'll show you something. Look at that cow which stands there, craned neck, waiting for Krishna. What philosophy will she understand? Where is she standing? It's up to you and to me to decide. Is it a rock? Is it a cloud? Is it a mushroom? It doesn't really much matter. And in this, which you can read and read, this glorious poetry from the Gita Govinda of Jayadeva, Krishna and Radha will start moving through the forest because Krishna's father, Nanda, says he is young, he is being frightened by the thunderstorm that is brewing, so take him home. And on the way, along the bank of the river Yamuna, the poet says their love began to unfold. The development, the unfolding of the love exquisitely done. The, everything is in the dark. It's, it's a darkness everywhere. Quietly the Yamuna flows in the background. The lover's eyes are locked. The world has been shut out from their presence. Time has come to a stop. But you and I can read it slightly differently too. We can read other things in it. If you go back this is the kind of a, the brooding mystery of the Indian forest. You can see that she's about to break into dance, so to speak. 
But let me take you back to this particular detail. Look at the trees. Far in the distance is a tree with split trunk. Move a little further to the right, as the trunks have come a little closer, and directly behind where Krishna and Radha are standing, embracing two trees are embraced. One dark, the other light up in complexion. Ganeshana, and she is Damini. Whereas image after image takes your breath away by the quality of it. Whether we look at that great brooding face of the Akbar, inwardly turned, or this painting of the dying man, Inayat Khan, whom we know about, there are delights here. There are magical things in this range of Indian paintings. And at the last slide, I want you to see this with some care. An old man, painting by Abu Hassan, standing, mendicant, pilgrim, whoever you would like, like to call him, infirm, wobbly legs, leaning on a staff, eyes almost bereft of any light, must be in hand. And this, the entire painting is free of anything else. The background is a kind of a gloomy blackish green. And the painter brings in this one flowering plant close to his feet. Why? I tell you a personal weakness of mine. I, every time I see this painting, a great poem by Ali Sardar Jafri comes to my mind, Mera Safar, and I'll recite it for you. I'll not translate all of it, but I cannot resist the temptation of linking this particular painting with a great poem of our times. Mera Safar, phir ek din aisa aayega, aankhon ke diye bujh jayenge, haathon ke kamal ko mulayenge, or Barge Zubase, Nutko Sadaki, Harpitli or Jayagi. A scene of death. A day will come when the flowers, the lotuses of my hand will begin to wilt, when the lamps of my eyes will begin to grow dim. Then from the branch which is my tongue, all butterflies of speech and articulation will fly away one by one. एक काले समंदर की तह में फूलों की तरह से हंसती हुई कलियों की तरह से खिलती हुई सारी शक्लें खो जाएंगी। In a dark eddying ocean, all the sights that I love, all the beautiful faces, will disappear one by one by one. एक नीले फिदा की मक्खन। And then he says, दिल की धड़कन, खून की गर्दिश, सब रागिनियाँ सो जाएंगी। All the melodies that I here, the beating of my heart, the coursing of blood in my veins will all fall silent. Phir koi nahi ye poochega. Sardar kaha hai maise? Nobody is going to turn around and say, where did this man Sardar go? But then, in the second part, lekin mein yahaan phir aunga, bachon ke dahan se bolunga, chidiyon ki duba mein gaunga, और जब भी जुगेंगे धरती में और कोंपले अपनी उंगली से मट्टी की तहों को छेड़ेंगी मैं पत्ती पत्ती कली कली फिर अपनी आंखें खोलूंगा और सर सब हटे हुए कर लेगा सब उनको हटे हुए I shall be back here again I will speak in the lisping tongue of the newborn I will like the little sparrow or the bird which twitter about in the garden and so on and I will when the shoots which begin to tease the surface of the soil, I'll emerge and I'll look all around and take dew drops in the palm of my hand, look in all directions. Sufehuwe patto se mere chalne ki sadaayin aayengi. 
आकाश की नीली सब झीलें धरती की सुनहरी सब नदियां हस्ती से मेरी भर जाए आई शिल टर्न इन टू दिस इन यूनिवर्स एंड तब सारा जमाना देखेगा द एंटायर वर्ल्ड विल देन सी हर किस्सा मेरा अफसाना है हर आशिक है सरदार जहां हर माशू का सुल्ताना है एवरी वन विल सी it's a literature festival so i thought i might as well recite it <laughs> then the whole world will know all stories which are being told are mine every lover bears the name sardar every beloved bears the name of my wife sultana at the last breath absolutely the last what am i main ek gureza lamha hu ayam ke afsu I am just a fugitive moment in this wonder of the sky. Main ek narasta khatra hu masroof e safar jo rehta hai maazi ki surahi ke dil se mustaqbal ke paimane. I am that trembling drop at the lip of the carafe about to be a carafe of the past about to be poured into the goblet of the future. Main sota hu aur jaagta hu और जाग के फिर सो जाता हूँ सदियों का पुराना खेल खेला मैं मर के अमर हो जाता हूँ बिकॉज ऑफ दिस प्लान दिस इज अ प्रोमिस ऑफ रिटर्न एवरी थिंग एल्स इज डार्क एंड क्लूमी वाई डिड द पोइट पुट द पेंटर पुट दिस लिटिल प्लान हेयर for you and me because i claim for myself the privilege of connecting a painting 400 years old and a poem which is less than 50 years old there are other things which i have but the time is run out so may i thank you very much thank <laughs> the word for this this part what's the word for this part the what the word for this part the, 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 uh, the raising of the hat of the hat <laughs> professor goswami talked earlier about uh, romahashi the uh, my my hairs are happy there's uh, this disease of goosebumps i think every person in this room diseased or otherwise <laughs> has experienced the sensation of goosebumps over the last hour we sadly don't have time for any questions but i think another last round of applause for <laughs> professor <laughs> we apologize for all the disruption in the middle of that session professor goswami will now be signing books in the book signing tent which is out and to your left please purchase a book from the amazon bookstore first please join me in thanking once again professor goswami and william dalrymple <laughs> the next session taking place in the mahindra humanity center durbar hall will be at 2:15 and will be Hitler's secret bunkers how Switzerland profited from the holocaust in the meantime there are two book launches happening in the rajnagandha front lawn there's a book launch of kuchtunli tasvirin by vishwajit prithvijit singh and in the google moogle tent book launch flavors of the frontier forgotten recipes from dira ismail khan a dialogue between vinodwa and maniza hashmi Oh, 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 oh,